like to play with fire Shaking Warfighter Nation. Ron here with Warfighter Ranch and Isaiah 6-8. It's been a minute. Happy 4th of July weekend. And last weekend, Helen and I were in Scottsdale at Family Life's Weekend to Remember. What an amazing time we had. Um, it was fantastic. It was an investment in our marriage, which when you think you can't invest anymore, you can. Guys, highly recommend it. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. Well, as they say, when God opens up a church, Satan opens up a hotel next door. And Satan was definitely waiting for us to get back from our weekend and have and you know get settled back into life again and everything. And then the other night, two nights ago, Helen and I, about ten o'clock at night, we just decide, you know what? We want milkshakes. So we go to Sonic and grab a couple of milkshakes. And no sooner do we make the U-turn out of Sonic to come around across the road than we are the first ones on scene at an accident. A motor vehicle accident. A young man and his friend were driving a Tesla. Wound up going 130 miles an hour through three red lights and ended up T-boning this poor guy in a Prius at the end of this engagement, and both cars were completely destroyed. I first approached the first victim in the Prius. He was conscious. He was okay. I'd gotten out of the car, obviously, at this point. Helm parked up under the, uh, under the 101 freeway there. Uh, underneath on the side where there are four ways on, and she was speaking to a witness, a woman who was upset. I could not have been more proud of Helen. She went into firewife mode extraordinaire. She started taking down information. She was on it. She was writing stuff down, relaying info to me over at the scene, because I was still at the scene assessing patients because there was nobody there. And... When I found this young man, the driver, he was just, he was sitting there unconscious behind the steering wheel, you know, and he was just unconscious doing this number. And all of these young men were our kids' age. So it struck me particularly hard in the heart. This is the night of July 3rd. And, uh, the two kids were pinned in the vehicle. So I went around to the passenger side of the Tesla and I talked to the, the, the kid who I thought was in the passenger seat. He was, he started out there. He wound up in the back seat. And I said, what's your name, son? And he told me his name. And as he told me his name, his face crested out of the shadows. And that's when I saw just his head was split open his fingers were going the wrong direction. This kid was messed up, but he was conscious, and he was conscious that he was messed up. He was in a little bit of shock. The guy in the Prius, completely in shock. And uh, police got there, cut the seatbelt, and then didn't evac the patient. Uh, fire showed up right about then as I was holding this kid's hand as he was unconscious, and that's when the batteries right next to my legs caught fire on the Tesla. So we were out celebrating our Independence Day. There are three sets of parents in Arizona that are free to love their still living children. So that's a blessing. So please pray for Micah, True, and Adam. Those are their names. God knows who they are. And then the next night, we went to see fireworks behind Texas Roadhouse. We go there every year for dinner about 7 and then go park it behind the restaurant there and look at the fireworks over at the baseball field. And it was lovely as usual until one of the fireworks missed shot and caught a bush on fire. 
Well, I knew I was going to be out there for a while watching fireworks. So I grabbed a sweet tea to go and I grabbed a coffee to go. Lucky me, right? A good NCO is always prepared. That being said, I see Helen, she yells fire. And I look over and see this burning bush and Moses was nowhere nearby. So I ran and I cleared apparently a hundred yards in about 10 seconds, not as fast as I used to be, and dumped all of my sweet tea, dumped all of my sweet tea, and all of my coffee on this bush, which still wasn't enough to put it out. And then the bike police showed up. So, you know, obviously we were safe. So that's two consecutive days of fighting fires as a retiree. And it just goes to show you that these things can happen any and everywhere. And today's message was for firefighters. Um, that's originally who we made this message for. But this this is all extra. This is all extra information because this is just what happened this week. Um, Helen and I got thrust back into the fray pretty rapidly, pretty violently at that first wreck and then the next night and last night I went to bed and I said as we're laying there in the dark I kissed my wife goodnight and I said you know it's it's kind of nice to not have to fight fire you know three days in a row and I never ever thought I'd say that so now on to the message because this message is for the public but it's also directed towards our firefighters we love this job and thank God every day for the good fortune that was bestowed upon us that we became firefighters. And what's not to love? We eat like kings, occasionally get paid to sleep, and watch TV or wash and wax our incredibly attractive fire apparatus. Much like other first responders, we have a home away from home and form friendships like no other. It is as good a life as anyone could expect. But one thing that I wish I had learned before becoming a firefighter was what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for us. Five major points I'd like to bring up here specifically related to firefighters, but these can definitely go for most first responders as well out there. Number one. The weight of the responsibility that we bear is crushing. Maintaining the illusion of an aloof but invincible know-it-all, can-do firefighter is work. Believe it or not, we do it not for ourselves, but for those who depend upon us. Firefighters are always on duty. There's no downtime. The mind is never at rest. People depend on us to know what and when they don't. There are millions of things that can go wrong at any second, and firefighters are expected to perform. We keep this knowledge buried for the most part, but it's always there. Two, we're not born with the necessary knowledge to be good firefighters. We have the aptitude for the job, sure, but that's not enough. It needs to be nurtured, constantly challenged, and it takes a lifetime of training. As you can see, sometimes the job doesn't stop even after you retire. And the training truly never ends. It is as constant as breathing. When a skill is learned, it needs to be relearned at every available moment. There's always something new to perfect, and perfection is elusive. The training is the foundation that everything else depends upon. Having the skills to perform embedded in you through repetition helps when the real deal eventually comes your way. Three, fear of failure is the greatest unspoken fear that every firefighter carries with them. Sure, we border on arrogance, saunter through town like we own the place, respond to emergencies with a can-do confidence basking in the glow of public confidence. But in the middle of the night, when there's nobody but you and the thoughts that run around your mind, things aren't so clear. A million scenarios play out before you, and you're questioning whether or not you have what it takes to respond. The what-if game knows absolutely no end. What if the train that usually rolls through town unnoticed derails and a toxic cloud of chlorine gas and anhydrous ammonia escapes? What if the baby that normally sleeps through the night is found not breathing at 3 in the morning? What if a truck carrying scrap metal takes the curb too quickly and rolls onto a car full of kids? 
What if a truck carrying scrap metal takes the curb too quickly and rolls onto a car full of college kids, trapping them, cutting them to shreds, and all you can do is watch them bleed to death while the crane that will free them slowly creeps up the highway? What if the kid who decided to hang himself changed his mind at the last second and you arrived just a second too late? What if the fire's too hot and a family of five burns to death three feet from where you stand, charged hose line in hand, unable to get even one inch closer? and the echo of their screams is all that is left of them when you finally force the door. So no, failure is not really an option. There is no nice try or participation trophies in firefighting. There is success and there is failure. Success is what makes firefighting great. Failure is soul-crushing, confidence-stealing, character-destroying misery. It's the greatest unspoken fear that every firefighter carries with them. We live with the knowledge that the risk of developing cancer is extremely high. Oh, I have no idea. Look, nobody wants to die. The myth that we will die so others may live is just that, a myth. What we will do is take ridiculous chances at rescuing people if and only if there's a chance that we'll come out alive. None of these firefighters who die in fires, collapses, accidents, or explosions do so willingly. It's an insult to the integrity of life to think otherwise. But we do. Most often it isn't during a daring rescue where images of a heroic firefighter are flashed across the screens of an adoring public. Most often we die alone, in bed, in agony, pain numbed by morphine. With a few people by our side, the ones that stayed with us during the struggle, when the lights are gone and the cameras no longer roll you're blessed, you'll have somebody there beside you. We quite often die from cancer. The things that burn emit toxins that we breathe in long after the fire is out. The diesel fumes in the station that no system can capture. The million and one chemicals that are created when a car catches fire. When a Tesla battery burns at your feet. When a Tesla battery burns at your feet. The asbestos we breathe. The dust that settles in our lungs and on our skin. These are just some of the things that we experience as a routine part of the job. Five. The things we see in this profession are worse than you can imagine. Going to work knowing that there is a very good chance something will happen that will eat away at your soul becomes business as usual. And that factor doubles for firefighters all across the DOD, all of our military firefighters out there because they have the stress of dying potentially in garrison due to an accident during morning PT. Think about it. And then there's the whole other side, the soldier side that takes you to war. That's a whole other level of things to deal with. Mentally preparing yourself to face death, disfigurement, madness, and disease becomes the norm while working or not. It eats away at humanity, your compassion, your ability to love freely and without guile. The feeling of impending doom will always be with you in some form or fashion, consciously or subconsciously. It matters not. What does matter is how you handle it. The toughest among us are usually not that tough at all. They're simply some of the healthiest. Those who joke about the dead and make small talk of the mentally unstable or those of us who suffer most and disguise the hurt with bravado. The rest of us just cope and get through each day the best we can. Firefighting is more than just a way to make a living. It's a way of life. But nothing in life is free. Except the free gift of salvation that you will only find in Jesus Christ. But even those who are fortunate enough to have the greatest job in the world know the price we pay. But for the benefit of those we love and those we protect and serve, we keep it to ourselves. And it's killing us, slowly but surely. I want to finish this message with a story from my very first trailer fire. A special forces guide redeployed and falling asleep with a cigarette in his hand in his 16 by 80 trailer just off post near Fort Campbell. We were called in as mutual aid because other municipal units were not only occupied, but we were actually the closest engine to the trailer park geographically. 
And it was very likely that one of our own was out there as the entire area was saturated with our military population. And if you don't know this, a single wide trailer will go up in smoke and be on the ground in no time flat. And as we got there, we saw the roof burning away flat on the ground as the entire trailer had already collapsed. It was a bed of hot coals and ashes by the time we got there. Judging by the flatness of the trailer, I had only assumed initially that there couldn't possibly be a body in there because we would be able to see it. But I was wrong. This was no rescue at all. This was now a recovery mission. And as we began sifting through the debris with pike poles and forestry rakes, the hook of my pike pole got stuck in the debris field. I took it out and pulled it back towards me, but it would give a little and then pull tight back. I thought for sure I was hooked into a bunch of wiring or something like that. As I yanked my pike pole back once more in my 22-year-old frame, the shape of my life, it began absolutely clear to me what I was stuck on. I radioed my captain, notified him that I had found the victim. I had poked a hole through the top of his skull with my pike pole and somewhat pulled him out of the coals. I've rarely spoken of this, honestly, and I've never experienced anything like it before. Uh, although they try to prepare us at the academy, there's nothing that can really prepare you for the real thing until you see it for yourself. We carefully and reverently wrapped him up in a tarp with pike poles on the sides for a makeshift gurney. As we were walking away, my captain, also an E7 in the Army Reserve, and a real country boy who's on the leading end of this operation, he suddenly stops, bringing me to a sudden halt. And we all know the human body is between 60 and 75% water. So laughing over his shoulder, he said, you know, they're a lot easier to tow out of here when all the juice is burned out of them. They're a lot lighter. That is also the day I learned what gallows humor was. Again, they touched on that at the Academy as well back then, but when that gallows humor slaps you right in the face for the first time, it's usually a gut-wrenching reality check. I was young then, and in retrospect, I think he was just trying to help me through the moment. It was the first time I had seen a dead American soldier, and it beat me up pretty good. Back then, there was no such animal as a critical incident stress debriefing. It simply didn't exist. We went back to work on shift that day, ate supper, and went on with the rest of our shift waiting for our next call. When we got back to the station, they asked us if we were good. Mike gave them a nod, and I replied with a quick and dismissive yup before retiring to the familiar comfort of the coffee pot in our dining area. Nothing more. Simple as that. For weeks, that call ate me up inside, and I know, in retrospect, that I really should have said something to someone. But back in the early 90s, this was career suicide. You just didn't risk it. But in 2024, I'm glad to say that our culture and society are much different in the way of addressing mental health issues. You no longer have to hang yourself on the wall of shame or risk ending your career and your family's well-being over what you think you can just suck it up and drive on. Although the mechanisms have changed and the possibilities are endless now for seeking assistance and getting help in all areas of our first responders' mental health, the one problem that has plagued mankind since the beginning remains our pride. If we're going to take pride in anything, we can take pride in a God that allows us to overcome these demons through nothing of our own, but by his son's mighty and eternal sacrifice. And I know you know this level of sacrifice because right now you're living it. Stay spiritually strong, trust in God and each other. Reach out if you need to. Your brothers and sisters are praying for you waiting for you, and counting on you. God bless. That's it for today. You've got your spiritual chow. Pass on to the next troop, next mission. Time now.